Okay, so I just wanted to go over some of the basics real quick. Um, this is a really simple circuit. It is a voltage source with a capacitor. Uh, coincidentally, the capacitors in Spintronics are also your voltmeters, um, which is kind of fun. But the, the dial tells you how many volts is over it. Um, but it's also a capacitor, so it's kind of a dual function thing. Uh, so we'll take that out of there. I'm going to slowly drain the voltage source without letting it short. Uh, yeah, so that's the that's the voltmeter. They're called spin volts. Um, and the reason it's a capacitor is because it wants to let, th uh, let charge store up, which means it winds the spring up, and then it wants to return it back to uh, sort of a neutral state. And you can actually see the springs in there, the very top. Pretty fun. Um, so they call these six volt sources, um, six spin volts, because if you attach them to a voltage source, or not a voltage source, a voltmeter, and I try to zero that out, and I charge it up, you can see that that uh, sort of display arm reads about six volts. So that's why these are six volt supplies. Uh, and if you were to put two of these in series, we'd get about 12 volts. Um, now these capacitors don't actually go up to 12 volts. So I can't show that. What I can do is I can hook up another one and show that it maxes out the, maxes out the voltmeter. So I'm gonna do that real quick. And theoretically, I can charge one of them up. This won't want to let current flow through it. But once I do both of them, it should easily max out the capacitor, and it does. That's uh, the maximum voltage the capacitor can read. It's like 10 volts, um, you know, which is pretty close to the 12 it should be. That's just a demonstration that two volt sources makes, you know, double the voltage if they're both the same. So that's a... Uh, actually charging a capacitor and showing how you can read volts. Um, so now I'm gonna hook up a resistor. I'm gonna go, go ahead and leave in these two uh, volt sources. So let's set that up. Here's are just sort of hard to turn. Like, of course it's hard to convey over video. But that's all they do is they make these little sprockets harder to turn. Um, I believe they do that by having uh, oil in the bearings and they just use a thicker oil. Um, that's how they get their resistance values higher or lower. So we're gonna do the same thing we did with the capacitor. Just wire this resistor in series. Uh, and this time, the circuit should keep spinning because the resistor's not going to just charge up and stop. It's going to uh, just make the current flow more slowly. So we'll start with one and the other, and it's already going. And you can kind of tell just by having one of these run that when you double the voltage, see how slowly it's running? When you double the voltage, it actually is going to double the current. And remember the current is how fast this chain is moving. So it goes about twice as fast when you have both sources uh, running like that. There we go. So now let's add a capacitor in parallel with one of these resistors, just for fun. So the way that works is you use one of these junctions. These are a fancy uh, set of gears on the sprockets. Uh, you can see there's a planetary gear in there that lets uh, these gears run um, sort of independently, sort of not independently. Uh, if I hold two of them still, you can't turn the third, uh, but if you hold uh, just one of them still, then the other two will spin opposite. Um, so 
They're a little bit uh, weird uh, analogy of a real current junction. I think it's just a downside of doing things with sprockets and chains, but they do work. So I'm going to hook up a capacitor in parallel with a resistor. And what should happen is the current, uh, you know, the speed of the chain should be uh, initially very high uh, because the capacitor will be empty, be discharged and uh, the current will want to fill it very quickly. Um, but once the capacitor is charged, the current will slow down and essentially just be as fast as the resistor lets it go. So we're expecting this to have very fast current and then pretty slow current. Once I get this set up. All right, so we're gonna Go ahead and let this rip. I'm gonna do one source first, and we'll do the other. So the current went really fast for a second. And actually, because I'm holding one of the sources still, it's discharging the capacitor, but I'm gonna let the other one run now. making that terrible sound because it's running the chain over this uh, bit of plastic right here. I need to change the angle of my volt source, which is what I will do. Okay, hopefully it will make quite the same terrible sound it did last time. So you can see the current uh, has stopped flowing through the capacitor, um, but yet we've charged it all the way up again. And you'll, you should see when we have both of these, when we have both of the voltage sources going, that the voltage we get is the same as when we had just the capacitor wired up. So the resistor is not actually causing a voltage drop. Just let it discharge there. Um, if I only run one of these voltage sources, that voltage across the capacitor should be six volts again. Uh, and it is. And it's just letting this sort of ratchet by. Um, and I think the easiest way to demonstrate the inrush current to that capacitor is with one source. So I'm gonna hook that up real quick. Okay, there we go. So now, when I release the cord on this voltage source, there should be a bunch of current to charge the capacitor up, and then it should just be current going through the resistor. So it's a little hard to see on camera. It charged the capacitor almost instantly, and now it's just got current going through the resistor. So the next thing we can do is we can uh, replace this capacitor with an inductor. Uh, now what an inductor does is it resists the change in current. Um, so if there's a certain amount of current flowing through it, it doesn't want the current to stop. So it's like these weights have momentum. You have to you know uh, push on them a certain amount in order to get these weights to stop spinning. Um, in the same way, uh, it's hard, it takes a little bit of effort to get these weights spinning up. So they want to kind of stay where they are. They don't want to be spinning if they're not spinning, they have inertia. So when I put this inductor in here, instead of this capacitor, what should happen is that initially all of the current will be going through this resistor because the weights won't want to move and all of the place that the current can go is the resistor. After a little bit of time though, you should see that this will start to spin up and will actually um, start taking a lot of the current from the resistor if it can over if it can overwhelm the source. The resistor might keep turning, we'll see. 
Uh, it wants to it wants to spin backwards. That's okay. I'll just let it stop moving real quick. I'm gonna have my finger here because I don't want that getting too fast. We'll see. I think the inductor has a brake on it, but here we go. Yeah, so there was enough current available that it could keep running the resistor as well. Um, but if you'd missed it, um, if you look really closely, you'll be able to see that uh, right at the beginning of when I release this rope, that uh, this uh, chain doesn't move. So let it let things stop moving. It's really hard to release the wire on camera. Sorry. You can tell just for an instant that it, it just takes just a second for that inductor to start spinning. And similarly, you can hear that the voltage source is clicking is clicking because it's being driven by this inductor. Um, and it's doing that after this uh, string runs out. So the voltage source gets the spinning, gets it spinning, gets the spinning, um, and then this stops driving it, but this still has momentum. So it has to do something with that momentum. And in this case, um, it just drives this uh, forward a little bit more. Um, if there's nowhere for that momentum to go, uh, it tries to chuck itself off the plate. Or it skips gears. It's skipping a tooth when I grab it. Uh, yes, you see how it threw the chain off. There's got to be somewhere for that momentum to go and that's exactly what happens in a, a real circuit as well um, If there's nowhere for that momentum to go uh, That electrical that magnetic momentum as it were um, Then it makes a giant voltage spike and blows up electronics So I'm gonna put a Transistor in here now Just to step things up a notch um, and these are fun, since they allow you to control the flow of current with, in this case, a voltage. This is um, essentially analogous to something called a MOSFET. Um, I won't go into how MOSFETs work right now, but uh, suffice it to say that um, MOSFETs work with voltage, and BJTs, um, or the other kind of transistor, uh, work with current. So, we'll hook this up. Um, I'm going to hook it up in series with a resistor. And remember, things in series for Spintronics are when they're all in the same chain. Um, or all being driven by the same set of chains, as it were. Actually, I should hold up this transistor to show how it works real quick. These are pretty fun. They're fancy. Um, they have this pulley down here. This is the pulley that most of the current goes through. Um, when this pulley, this sprocket on the top, uh, turns, you can see it has these little lobes at the top. So when this turns, it pulls those little balls inward. Those are connected to these arms. And those arms are connected to these like little tiny brakes. You can kind of see them move in and out. Ever so slightly. Um, and those brakes push on this uh, rubber gasket. So this is like uh, a friction material. And it's actually very hard to turn this uh, while those brakes are on. Um, but if I turn those off by twisting the top here, this spins freely. So that's how they've made an analogy to a transistor. So we're going to put the main belt on this lower sprocket. There we go. So I'm charging the voltage, um, basically the battery, and there's no current flowing because the transistor is off. And you can tell it's off because this arm is in the middle of this big slot. Um, but if I turn this top sprocket a little bit, current starts to flow. 
So this is all the way on, and this is all the way off. The cool thing about transistors is they're not just switches, so it's not just on or off. Um, they can also sort of limit the current to somewhere in between on and off. So like right now, I'm just letting the current flow a tiny bit. It's not off, it's not all the way on. You can just let it flow a tiny bit. Uh, real world transistors can do that as well, which is why we have things like uh, amplifiers. So we can take you know the very small signal from your phone and drive speakers with it, with much more power. Um, yeah, that's what a transistor is like. And they're pretty fun. So next, I want to build a circuit that does not require a battery. Uh, Steve Mold um, also did this, but I wanted to build a couple versions of it. And it is a filter. Um, filters are a really essential part of electronics. Um, they're what let you control noise on signals. There are what let you, for instance, have uh, a subwoofer for your sound system that can be controlled to be louder or quietly, quieter, uh, independent of uh, the rest of your sound system. There's a lot of cool things you can do with filters. So, what I'm gonna do so I'm going to set up a high pass filter, meaning that when I turn my source fast, the signal gets to where I want it to go. When I turn my source slow, um, the signal gets eaten by the filter and doesn't make it to where I want it to go. Um, so we're just going to use my 50 ohm uh, resistor here. It spins pretty easy, which is why I'm using it. I don't want to just use something like a switch, which spin freely when they're not on, because uh, I want there to be some resistance there. Okay, there we go. So kind of get the idea of how that works. If I spin my input, this red sprocket, really fast, you can see almost all of the signal, the, the way I'm moving the chain back and forth, almost all of that movement is translated to my output right there. Um, however, if I move it very slowly, can see that the inductor eats my signal and that 50 ohm resistor almost doesn't turn which is pretty fun now, if I were to put a capacitor here instead of the inductor, what do you think would happen? So remember the capacitor resists a change in voltage. It wants to stay exactly the same position, whereas the inductor just doesn't want things to change too fast. So, theoretically, I have set up a, a low-pass filter now, whereas the other one was a high-pass filter. So, low-pass filter meaning that slow movements should correlate well with the output. Slow movements on the input will correlate well with the output. However, if I move it faster, the input won't move as much. So let's give that a try. So here's a slow movement, and there's the output moving at about the same amount. So that's working. When we move it slow now, uh, we no longer have an inductor eating all of it, which is great. 
And now let's try moving it fast. It's a little harder to tell. I would keep an eye on that blue link on the right here, on the chain going to the resistor, and see how little that moves and how much I'm moving the feed chain. Oh, it's hard to do this without breaking things. So that capacitor, when I move things quickly, eats more of my signal. And this is actually one of the reasons why uh, circuits that operate at very high frequencies are difficult to design sometimes, um, because there is sort of um, parasitic capacitance everywhere. And when you're designing at very high frequencies, uh, as you can tell, um, you're trying to wiggle this very quickly, that capacitance starts to eat my signal along the way. So if I have, say, a badly designed HDMI cable, like going from your TV to like your uh, DVD player or your smart device, um, if I have a badly designed cable, those little signals uh, are working really hard to get from one end to the other, um, partially because they're being eaten by stray capacitance. Um, so that's one of the reasons why high-speed circuits are hard. One, one of the many reasons. <laughs> now, another way to design a high-pass filter, rather than sort of shorting your signal out with an inductor, is to still use a capacitor. The capacitor can be our friend, um, but it has to be placed in series uh, with the resistor. So let's try that. So this might not look like it's in series, but it is. Um, so now with this capacitor in series, this is a high pass filter. So if I move the input slowly, that resistor, I've made a mistake somewhere in my thinking. I've got to figure out how to build this in Spintronics. Okay, so I had a conceptual failure on the previous example, which is okay. Means I'm learning stuff too. Um, this is a proper setup for a um, RC filter that's supposed to be a uh, high pass. Uh, in this case, this is our output resistor, um, and this is a resistor going to ground, essentially. So what I'm doing is when I move this slow, you can see that the ground, um, our, our non-output uh, resistor, the resistor where we don't want the signal to go, well, it's eating all of our signal which is really annoying sometimes, um, or sometimes that's what you want. Uh, however, if I move this faster, something cool happens. Oh, besides me breaking everything. Something really cool happens. Zach breaks everything. It's really cool when it happens, trust me. All right, I'm gonna spin this really fast, or faster. You can see this chain starts to move more. And it really wants me to move it much quicker than I'm really easily able to. But it's most obvious when I turn it slowly, and you can see it's pretty evident that this chain barely moves versus moving almost in sync with the drive chain when I'm moving it fast. So that's how you can make a high pass filter with a capacitor and a resistor rather than a low pass filter.